Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we're going to be figuring out which chemical is the most risky. So when you're working with chemicals, there's a lot of risks. Let's see which ones are the most risky. Let's start off with terbutyl hydroperoxide. Terbutyl hydroperoxide has a rating of 444, that's its NFPA safety rating. It's commonly used as an oxidizing agent in organic chemistry, it has great solubility in organic solvents, and as long as it's stored in solution, it's pretty stable. However, if you try and ship a solution that's more than 90% terbutyl hydroperoxide, it's extremely unstable and it's actually forbidden by the US Department of Transportation. If you get this liquid on your skin or eyes, it causes severe burns, it may explode in a fire, and if it's distilled dry, it can explode. This chemical is way scarier than I originally thought. I've seen it used in a lot of papers, but I've never used it myself personally. As a rule of thumb in chemistry, if you see a peroxide which has a COOH linker, that means that it probably poses some risks. So terbutyl hydroperoxide, this can go right into S tier. Easy, no problems. Now let's talk about cyanogen. Cyanogen has a rating of 442. It was actually discovered by Gay-Lussac, who we've discussed in the graduated cylinder video. If you haven't checked out that video, I'd encourage you to check it out. I did a lot of research for that video. And if you haven't seen it, I'm pretty sure you'll enjoy it because it's a really good story. This chemical is synthesized industrially through the oxidation of hydrogen cyanide. You might be thinking, hydrogen cyanide's already pretty bad. Can we make something else really bad with it? Yes, apparently we can. It can be converted to cyanogen. Now, not only is this something that we produce from cyanide, but it's something that's been found in the tail of Halley's Comet. It was also used historically by photographers in the form of cyanogen soap to remove silver stains from their hands. So somehow this was safe enough to use the soap, and I find that extremely surprising. In addition to all of its safety concerns, it produces the second hottest known natural flame after carbon subnitride, and it burns at a temperature at over 4,500 degrees Celsius when it burns in the presence of oxygen. Hey, by the way, it's also explosive in the presence of oxygen. This is a pretty scary chemical. If anyone was working in the lab with cyanogen, I would be terrified. This probably also belongs in S tier, but because it only has a rating of 2 for how unstable it is, we're going to put it into A tier. Now right there, I just mentioned that it was unstable. So what do these NFPA ratings actually mean? Well, I'll put a graphic on screen now, and the NFPA rating explains how dangerous chemicals are in terms of health, flammability, and instability. These are somewhat subjective, and the ratings that you get from one vendor to another might vary. But in terms of health, if it's a 4, it means exposure can be lethal once. If it's a 3, it means it could cause serious or permanent injury. If it's 2, it could cause temporary incapacitation or injury that lasts. If it has a rating of 1, it could cause significant irritation. And if it's 0, there's no hazard at all. Now in terms of flammability, if it has a rating of 4, it can vaporize and burn easily at normal temperatures. If it's a 3, it can be ignited under almost all ambient temperatures. If it's 2, it needs to be heated to higher temperatures if you want it to burn. And if it's a 1, it means that preheating is necessary before ignition can occur. Now, in terms of instability, this is basically how likely it is to explode. And if it's a 4, basically you want to run away as quickly as possible. If it's a 3, it might be able to explode if exposed to high temperature or shock. If it's a 2, a big chemical change or high temperature or pressure could cause it to go. And if it's a 1, it's normally pretty stable, but maybe it's unstable at high temperatures. So essentially, if there's a 4 in any of these categories, this chemical is sketchy AF, and you need to treat it with a lot of care and respect. If there's a 4 in more than one of these categories, you need to be extremely careful. Like, so, so careful. Because one mistake could make everything go really badly really quickly. If it has a 4 in all 3, you probably shouldn't work with it ever unless you have a lot of safety protocols in place and you're prepared for all three things to go wrong. Just for reference, if something has a four in each, that means when you're exposed, you can die, or you can die in the fire, or you can die from the explosion. And so an exploding flammable toxic mess is super scary. So back to the tier list, propargyl bromide. Propargyl bromide is frequently used in organic synthesis. It has a rating of 334. It's useful for introducing propargyl groups. It's a good electrophile. Sometimes if you want to have a reaction work really well, propargyl bromide will be used. Although it's also a potent lacrimator. And what that means is it'll make you tear and it will irritate the sinuses and all mucous membranes. I thought that this was overstated, but then I worked with it a couple times and it's no joke. It is very offensive to your face and you definitely want to work with this in a fume hood and only within a fume hood. It's also a potent alkylating agent, so it's definitely toxic. 
it has a flash point of 18 degrees Celsius, and it can also explode as a 3% mixture in air. Guess what? Also, certain metals cause it to explode, so that's great, and it's shock sensitive. Now, you might be wondering, what is the flash point? The flash point of a material is the lowest liquid temperature at which, under certain conditions which are standardized, the liquid is able to give off enough vapor that it is capable of forming a flammable mixture with air. So if something's above its flash point and there's a spark, it will ignite. So you need to be careful. So propargyl bromide's a little bit scary. I've worked with it in the lab without too many issues. And because it only has a rating of 334, I think we could probably put this one into C tier. Now, arsene gas. Arsene is an arsenic derivative, and it has a rating of 442. You might be thinking, oh, this only has a 2 in the instability category. That's not this bad. A 4 and a 4 is still super scary. Almost nobody in organic chemistry works with arsenic derivatives anymore because they're really toxic. And arsine is a gas. It's a confirmed human carcinogen, and it's also acutely lethal. As a result of exposure, you can get kidney damage, and this can be long-lasting. Guess what? It also causes pneumonia. The way arsine is toxic is it attacks the hemoglobin of red blood cells, and this causes the body to break them down. When present in air, arsine spontaneously reacts with oxygen, and people thought about using it as a chemical warfare agent, but it was never used because it was too flammable. So arsine goes into S tier. You might be thinking, how risky is arsine? It doesn't even explode. If anyone in the lab I was working in was working with arsine gas, I wouldn't even work in that lab. I would leave for a day, maybe a week, maybe till they were done their research. That is too risky for me. I just paused there briefly to respond to a text message from Hamilton Morris. By the way, I recorded a podcast episode with Hamilton Morris. You can find that on his Patreon now, and it should be coming up on his YouTube channel in the near future. I'll include a link to that in the description if you want to check it out. So the next chemical is monomethylhydrazine. Monomethylhydrazine has a rating of 434, and it's used as a rocket propellant in conjunction with some oxidizers. So this is a fuel. It's also been used as a propellant for orbital maneuvering systems and the reaction control system in NASA space shuttles. You might be surprised to know that derivatives of this are found in some fungi, such as in the mushrooms of gyromitra, which I've actually discussed in a video about mycotoxins. I'll include a link to that in the description, and if you're interested in chemistry of fungi, it's a video you're not going to want to miss. There's this molecule called gyromitrin, and when the fungi are cooked, it releases monomethylhydrazine. The mushrooms become edible after cooking, but if you breathe in the monomethylhydrazine as it cooks, that could be game over for you. And if you handle the mushrooms without protecting your skin, that could also be game over. This is a really scary chemical. In addition to its severe toxicity, it's extremely flammable, which makes sense because it's rocket fuel. It has a really low flash point of minus eight degrees Celsius, and it can explode as a 2.5% mixture in air. So monomethylhydrazine, I think also belongs into S tier because if someone was working with that in the lab, you wouldn't want to be anywhere near them. In retrospect, I think the terbutyl hydroperoxide probably belongs in A tier because people could work with that in a lab and I wouldn't be as concerned, even though it has the highest rating possible of 444. This is still really dangerous. All of these are really dangerous. Just because something's in a slightly lower tier doesn't mean it's not bad at all. It's still really bad. Let's talk about diazomethane. Diazomethane has a rating of 433. It's a really convenient methylating agent because when you use it, the only byproduct is nitrogen gas, and that's really convenient. You don't have to do anything with that nitrogen gas other than give it room to escape. Now, if it reacts too quickly, maybe that could be an explosion. It's also extremely acutely toxic. It could be chronically toxic as well, but its acute toxicity outweighs its chronic toxicity. There's been several deaths reported associated with diazomethane. In one instance, a laboratory worker consumed a hamburger near their fume hood where they were generating large amounts of diazomethane. And four days later, this person died from fulminating pneumonia. Don't eat in the labs and especially don't eat anywhere near chemicals, especially ones that could cause fulminating pneumonia, for goodness sakes. You might think that's pretty bad. That's a good enough reason not to work with it. Well, it turns out that it can also explode in contact with sharp edges of containers, such as in glassware. Even if there's a scratch in the glassware, it could detonate. So that's pretty spooky. Most of the time when people work with diazomethane nowadays, they work with a derivative called TMS diazomethane. But this one still has several of the risks associated with diazomethane, and there are many deaths reported with that chemical as well, although it is less dangerous. The final comment I have about diazomethane is that it explodes when it's heated above 100 degrees Celsius, 
or if you expose it to intense light, alkali metals or calcium sulfate. That's right, drywall. Diazomethane can also go right into S tier. Great reagent, but it can be really scary to work with it. Up next, we have nickel tetracarbonyl. It has a rating of 433, and it's an intermediate in the MOND process for producing very high purity nickel. The cool thing about this complex is it forms when nickel is treated with carbon monoxide, so if you produce low-grade nickel, you can convert it to this complex and sublime off or distill off the nickel tetracarbonyl and then heat it to cause the carbon monoxide ligands to pop off of the nickel again. So essentially what this is doing is it's like distilling the nickel, although they're converting it to a chemical derivative so that it can be distilled. Now you might think that this is toxic just based on the fact that there's carbon monoxide linked to it, but it's actually one of the most dangerous substances encountered in nickel chemistry because of its high toxicity, high volatility, and rapid skin absorption. Some of the toxicity comes from the fact that nickel in its metallic form is released in the body, and this can be fatal if absorbed through the skin or inhaled due to its high volatility. If that wasn't bad enough, nickel tetracarbonyl can also auto-ignite. When you have this as a vapor in air, it has a half-life of about 40 seconds, and if it's present as a 2% mixture in air, it can explode. Nickel tetracarbonyl also can go right into S tier. Absolutely horrifying. Let's just make a bit of room because... S tier is going to be popular today. Hydrogen cyanide. I'm sure all of you are familiar with hydrogen cyanide. It has a rating of 442. It was used as a chemical weapon in World War I by France, the US, and Italy, but it wasn't too effective. It's a well-known poison. However, if it's given in small enough amounts, our body can actually break it down. The toxicity of hydrogen cyanide comes from the fact that it inhibits cytochrome C oxidase, which is the last enzyme in the electron transport chain. The electron transport chain in eukaryotes, such as us, take place in the mitochondria, which is like the US stock exchange of the cell. ATP is like the American dollar of the mitochondria. It's a better analogy than the powerhouse of the cell because there's a lot of different energy intermediates that your cells use, such as GTP, GDP, ADP, and glucose. So we're just converting energy from one form to another based on what's needed. So there's a lot of trades made at any given time. Guess what? Hydrogen cyanide is also extremely flammable, and it's explosive at 5% concentrations in air. If someone was working with sodium cyanide or potassium cyanide, I'd be like, okay, yeah, I'm going to be careful around their stuff. I'm probably not going to go into their fume hood when they're working with it. If someone's working with hydrogen cyanide as a liquid or gas, I'm not going anywhere near their fume hood. I'm probably not even going into their lab. Hydrogen cyanide is another easy S-tier chemical. Here we have tert butylithium. Now, for non-chemists, you might not have heard of tert-butyllithium before. This chemical is a really strong base in organic chemistry, and it's pyrophoric, so if this is sprayed in air, it's a flamethrower. It spontaneously combusts. There have been several serious incidents in laboratories where chemists have been exposed to tert-butyllithium, and as a consequence, there's even been deaths, such as the death of Sherry Sangi at UCLA in 2008. This is something that's been taught in every safety training program I've gone through when working in chemistry at a university, and this is a chemical you don't want touching any part of your body. It's pyrophoric, so once this gets on you, it sets you on fire, and it's going to keep burning. It's usually stabilized in a solvent, but it's pyrophoric, and most solvents are flammable. So once it's in there, it just catches fire. And if you're in a research lab, almost everything you're working with is flammable. So things go wrong really quickly. Terp butylithium has a rating of 444, and personally, I think the health rating is overstated. However, you're probably going to die if this touches your skin anyway, not from toxicity effects, but from being burned alive. This is a really scary chemical. It can go right into S tier as well. If someone's working with it, everybody treats it with the utmost care. Acetaldehyde. This has a rating of 343, and it's one of the simplest aldehydes. It's surprisingly volatile with a boiling point of 20 degrees Celsius. And when I've worked with this, I've poured it into a graduated cylinder before to dilute it with some solvent like methanol, and it can all boil at once. Like, boom, like it suddenly all goes. And this is because it's got a boiling point of 20 degrees Celsius. I personally like the smell of acetaldehyde. It smells a lot like grapes, or if someone's been drinking alcohol, it has the smell of like alcohol on someone's breath if they've been having a couple drinks. There have been many cases of acute toxicity from acetaldehyde, and it's also a known carcinogen. In fact, it's the active carcinogen made from the metabolism of ethanol. It has a flash point of minus 39 degrees Celsius, making it extremely flammable. It's also possible to convert acetaldehyde into polymers, but I'm not sure about how prevalent this is. Acetaldehyde can go into C tier, 
because people can work with it in the lab and it's not too scary. Although I would recommend you to work with it while it's cold because it's extremely volatile. And it might be a liquid in a bottle when you work with it, but the second you open the bottle, it could spray everywhere. Definitely something you want to avoid. Here we have trimethyl aluminum. This is a Lewis acid that's commonly encountered in organic chemistry. And it can also be used as a nucleophilic methylating agent, similar to methyl Grignard reagents. It's extremely pyrophoric and it readily combusts in the presence of air. It can also cause severe skin and eye damage. So you won't be too surprised when I tell you that it has a rating of 343. Trimethyl aluminum, it's very flammable, it's pyrophoric, it's another flamethrower chemical. I think we could put trimethyl aluminum into B tier because it's pretty scary when people are working with it. This chemical here is acrylonitrile. This has a rating of 432 and it's a monomer present in many commercial polymers such as styrene acrylonitrile, acrylonitrile butadiene styrene ABS, this is what Lego is made out of, as well as many other polymers such as nitrile based rubbers. It's highly toxic at low doses, it's extremely flammable, and once it's polymerizing, it can explosively polymerize, and if it gets too hot, it can decompose to make hydrogen cyanide. Guess what? It's also believed to be a carcinogen. If someone's working with this in the lab, I would definitely want to be avoiding them, but it's not the scariest thing ever. I think this probably belongs in B tier. This odd looking chemical is called stibine. It's a derivative of antimony, and since it's a pnictogen, which is the same row that nitrogen, phosphorus, and arsenic are in, it behaves similar to arsine. Likewise, it binds to the hemoglobin of red blood cells, causing the body to destroy it, making it extremely toxic, with an LC50 of 100 ppm in mice. It's also highly flammable, giving it a rating of 443. This is another chemical that belongs right into S tier, which is appropriate, because it starts with an S. Similar to trimethyl aluminum, we have triethyl aluminum. The advantage with triethyl aluminum is it's a little bit less volatile. These bulky groups might make it more desirable as a Lewis acid, and it can also be used as a nucleophilic ethylating agent. It's highly pyrophoric. This is another liquid flamethrower chemical. This chemical can go into the same tier as trimethyl aluminum because it has essentially the same hazards. Another really strong base is N-butylithium. N-butylithium is kind of like terpbutylithium, but it's safer to handle, although it can still cause fires if you're not careful. It's a really common base in organic chemistry, although it can also combust in air. It's nowhere near as severe as terpbutylithium, but it does still pose the risk of a laboratory fire. If you're a chemist and you're listening to this, I would encourage you to always titrate your N-butylithium before using it, especially if the bottle hasn't been touched in a week or so. The easiest way to do this is with N-benzyl benzamide, and I'll include a reference to a paper talking about the titration of this in the description. And then you know the exact concentration of it when you're working with it. Then you don't need to add more than you actually need. Usually when people sell this, it's sold as a solution in hexanes or some other alkane-based solvent. N-butylithium is a scarier one compared to all chemicals, but compared to the chemicals on this list, I think this probably has to be like an E-tier chemical. Not that scary. N-bule has a rating of 343. Butadiene. Butadiene has a rating of 342, and it's used in the production of synthetic rubber. When people are exposed to butadiene over a long period of time, there's been an association between it and cardiovascular disease, and it's also known to be a carcinogen, with strong association between it and leukemia. The International Agency for Research on Cancer has designated this as a Group 1 carcinogen, and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, also lists this chemical as a carcinogen. If that wasn't bad enough, it's also suspected to be a teratogen in human. Teratogens are a group of substances that may cause birth defects via some toxic effect on the embryo or fetus. This also has a flashpoint of minus 85 degrees Celsius, so this is extremely flammable. Butadiene, due to all these toxicity concerns, can also go into S tier. I personally haven't encountered this in a research lab, but it might be something that's more commonly encountered in polymer labs that do radical polymerizations. Germane. Germane is like methane or silane, but instead of a carbon or a silicon, we have a germanium atom. You might think of this as something really obscure that nobody uses, but it's actually used in the semiconductor industry in a method for growing germanium crystal thin films. At high temperatures, it decomposes to germanium metal and hydrogen gas, and it's also extremely toxic. Inhalation or exposure to germane may result in several unpleasant effects, including vomiting, kidney energy, or hemolytic effects. So you shouldn't be too surprised that this has a rating of 443. Germane is also extremely flammable, and it can spontaneously ignite in air. Germane is another chemical I wouldn't want to be anywhere near in the lab. This can go right into S tier. 
Ethylene oxide is a really important chemical. It's used in the production of many consumer products such as polyethylene glycol. This is present in surfactants, it's present in vaccines, it's present in many, many things. And it's also used to sterilize medical equipment in hospitals and in the production of sterile syringes. Steam sterilization can be used as a method to kill everything that could potentially be contaminating medical equipment but ethylene oxide is a more desirable alternative for some applications. It's an alkylating agent, so the body can react with it and this can open up the epoxide, and it has irritating, sensitizing, and narcotic effects. Chronic exposure to this is also mutagenic, so you won't be too surprised to hear that this has a rating of 343. At concentrations in the air of about 200 parts per million, ethylene oxide irritates the mucous membranes of the nose and throat, when this gets to higher concentrations, it can cause damage to the trachea and bronchi, and it can eventually cause the partial collapse of the lungs. If that wasn't bad enough, higher concentrations can cause pulmonary edema and damage of the cardiovascular system. Sometimes the effects aren't right away, and it can sometimes occur even 72 hours after exposure. If that wasn't bad enough, it's highly flammable with a flash point of minus 20 degrees Celsius, and there are several instances of documented explosions. This is another chemical that can go right into S tier. Very, very scary. In my experience, when working with epoxides in the presence of bases, as the epoxides ring open, the reaction gets hotter and hotter and hotter, and they can run away and get way hotter than you were expecting, and this can result in possible explosions or other near misses. TFE. This is the monomer for Teflon, which is often used in non-stick applications such as frying pans. And the International Agency for Research on Cancer classifies TFE as a probable carcinogen to humans based on animal studies. Now, while toxicity concerns are something we do want to worry about, the main hazard with TFE is that it can cause an explosion. As in the presence of oxygen, this makes tetrafluoroethylene oxide, and this is an explosive compound. Usually the detonation of tetrafluoroethylene oxide is sufficient to trigger an explosion of TFE, converting it to carbon tetrafluoride and elemental carbon. This is a really scary chemical, and... Oftentimes when people work with it, they need to work with it in a bunker. This can go into S tier. Trichlorosilane. You might think this is another obscure chemical with no real use, but this is used in the preparation of ultra pure silicon in the semiconductor industry. It has a rating of 342, and in water it rapidly decomposes to produce a siloxane polymer and gives off hydrochloric acid. This compound is corrosive to the eye, skin, and respiratory tract, and it will likely produce silica in the body when exposed to moisture. Not a good thing to get anywhere near you. Inhalation of the vapor can cause lung edema. It's extremely flammable, and it has a flash point of minus 27. This one also explodes in air. Another really scary chemical. I've seen this in research labs. The bottles are usually caked in crystals. I think as long as you're being careful with this one, it's not too bad, but it's still pretty scary to hear some of the possible consequences of working with this. This next one is pentaborane 9. You might be surprised with how high the rating on this one is. It's a highly reactive compound, and because of its reactivity towards oxygen, it was once evaluated as rocket or jet fuel. It's a volatile, colorless liquid, which boils at 60 degrees Celsius, which is way lower than I would have guessed for this compound, and it's extremely toxic. In fact, its acute toxicity is comparable to some nerve agents. I just recently made a tier list about nerve agents, and if you haven't seen it yet, I'd encourage you to check it out. Pentaborane's rating is 444. Its vapors are heavier than air, it's pyrophoric, and it can ignite spontaneously in contact with air when it's even slightly impure. This is a really scary chemical. I don't know of anyone working with this in the lab personally. We can put it into S tier. Diethyl ether hydroperoxide. So this chemical is frequently discussed in research labs as a product formed through the oxidation of diethyl ether. I have a video discussing the formation of diethyl ether hydroperoxide in solvents. If you haven't seen that yet and you're interested in checking it out, I'll put a link to that in the description. This peroxide is often blamed for the explosion of diethyl ether containing solutions. Usually explosions of peroxides happen when you concentrate down solvent, and it turns out that this is a hydroperoxide that can be distilled. Would I recommend anybody tries distilling this? Absolutely not. These things can go really wrong really quickly. It's like diethyl ether, so it's still highly flammable. It's highly explosive, as are most peroxides. Diethyl ether hydroperoxide, another really scary chemical. If someone was working with this on its own, I wouldn't be anywhere near the lab, right into S tier. Diethyl ether hydroperoxide has a rating of 244. 
Now for dichlorosiline, the rating's 442. This is still really high, this chemical's really toxic, and it can be used in chemical vapor deposition chambers in conjunction with ammonia to grow silicon nitride for semiconductors. It's really toxic, and similar to trichlorosilane, it's highly flammable with a flash point of minus 37 degrees Celsius. This one can also go into B tier, because I think if you're working with this one and you're not being too stupid, it should be fine. Maybe this one belongs in A tier, but we, we can keep it in B tier. Vinyl chloride. This is the monomer for PVC, as in PVC pipes. Prior to 1974, workers were commonly exposed to 1000 ppm vinyl chloride, and it caused something called vinyl chloride illness. This caused symptoms such as bony flanges in the hand and feet would break down, and it caused another symptom called Raynaud's phenomenon, which is a medical condition in which the spasm of small arteries causes reduced blood flow to and arterioles. Here's a picture of what this looks like. Vinyl chloride is also highly flammable, and since it has a low boiling point of minus 13.4 and a flash point of minus 61 degrees Celsius, it is really dangerous. It poses an explosion hazard as well. This has a rating of 342, and this is a scary chemical, but I think as long as you're working with it responsibly, it isn't too bad. It still is really volatile, so you have to work with it as a gas, and that's not too commonly encountered in most labs. We can put this one into C tier, but it's still a relatively scary chemical. Now, diborane. This is a chemical which forms through the dimerization of borane. I think diborane might be called diborane because it's a borane that might make you die. It's been tested as a rocket propellant, and it's often used as a reducing agent when converted into other complexes, such as BH3THF. This is another really toxic chemical. It's also pyrophoric, spontaneously igniting in air at 38 degrees Celsius. This is another chemical that belongs right into S tier, as it's a perfect four. We have three chemicals left. Picric acid. Picric acid has a rating of 344 and it was the first strongly explosive nitrated organic compound that was able to be used in munitions in conventional artillery. Picric acid is also surprisingly acidic with a pKa of 0.38. This is a strong acid. And oftentimes in chemistry, historically, we've seen pick rates as the anion for various cation complexes. This has fallen out of favor though because pick rates are explosive. This is akin to TNT, but picric acid has also seen use as an antiseptic and it's somewhat toxic. If you avoid working with it, you'll probably be fine, but it's really explosive. This one can go into S tier. If it was handled in a dilute solution, it wouldn't be as bad, but it's still quite a dangerous chemical. Diethyl aluminum chloride. This is another Lewis acid. It's somewhat commonly encountered in organic chemistry. It's highly flammable. It's also pyrophoric. I don't have too much to say other than that. This is a chemical that is a little bit scarier because it can also form HCl as it hydrolyzes. It's still pyrophoric. This one could go, I think, in A tier, which is appropriate because there's aluminum in it. And last but not least, we have silane. Silane has a rating of 243. It's used as a precursor to other silicon compounds. So if we want to make other derivatives in chemistry, we have to start somewhere. So silane can be a precursor to other silicon containing compounds. This is a pyrophoric gas. It can detonate, and there have been several fatal industrial accidents related to its use. Additionally, Nile Red has a video on this where he makes magnesium silicide. And in the presence of water, this reacts and forms silane gas. I'll include a link to that in the description if you want to check it out. I think silane is pretty dangerous. It's not as dangerous as some of the other ones we put into S tier, but I think it probably still belongs in A tier. As you can see, there are a lot of chemicals with hazards associated with them. And you should always be really safe when you're working with anything with a severe rating in the lab. Always check the hazards of what you're working with before you work with it so that you can be prepared for when things inevitably go wrong. If you like tier lists like this, I have even more tier lists on the channel. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.